Welcome to the Learn the Word podcast, where you will be challenged to grow in your knowledge of the Word of God in relationship to the God of the Word, where we will discuss issues of Bible interpretation as well as matters of practical application. I'm your host, Paul Weaver, Professor of Bible and Theology at the Word of Life Global Bible Institute. Our main campus is here in Scroon Lake, New York, and we have 10 additional accredited teaching sites around the world. To learn more about the Word of Life Bible Institute, visit us at wordoflife.edu. That's wordoflife.edu. I welcome back to the Learn the Word podcast four very special guests. My first guest is Dr. John Altizer. Dr. Altizer is the lead pastor of Trinity Community Church in Christiansburg, Virginia. He's also the professor and chair of the Bible Department at the National Theological College and Graduate School. Dr. Altizer has a bachelor's degree from Liberty University, a master's degree from Piedmont Baptist College, and his PhD in systematic theology from Baptist Bible Seminary. My second guest is Dr. Christopher Cohn. Dr. Cohn is the president and CEO of Agathon EDU. Prior to this, he served at several different Christian institutions of higher education, including as the president of Calvary University, the president of Tyndale Theological Seminary, and the chief academic officer at Southern California Seminary. He's a graduate of Tyndale Bible Institute, Schofield Graduate School, and Regent University, and did his PhD work at the University of North Texas. My third guest is Professor Christopher Katolka. Professor Katolka is the Assistant Director of North American Ministries with Friends of Israel Gospel Fellowship. He's also the radio and podcast host for the Friends of Israel Today radio program and a regular contributor to Israel My Glory magazine. He earned a Bachelor of Science from Cairn University and a Master of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary. My fourth and final guest on today's program is Dr. Michael Stallard. Dr. Stallard is the International Ministries Director of the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry. Prior to this, he was the Dean of Baptist Bible Seminary in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. During this time, he also served as the Professor of Systematic Theology for 22 years. Dr. Stallard studied at the University of Alabama, Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary, and earned his PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary. Gentlemen, welcome back to the Learn the Word podcast. Today, we continue the second part in our two-part podcast series on the subject of hermeneutics. If you're not yet able to listen to last week's podcast, I encourage you to go back and listen to it first, as today's podcast will build upon it. In last week's podcast, we defined and described hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is often popularly defined as the art and science of Bible interpretation. It is a science because there are certain principles that should be applied for one to come to a proper interpretation of scripture. However, it's also an art because it takes practice to become effective and accurate interpreter of scripture. Last week, we also discussed several hermeneutical principles of interpretation. We discussed the historical principle. The Bible must be interpreted in light of its historical context. We answered the answering the questions, the W questions, who, what, why, where, when. We discussed the grammatical principle in last week's podcast. God used languages, specifically Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and the rules that govern those languages to communicate his revelation to mankind. Words have meaning, and the very words of scripture are God's words if they reflect a proper translation of the original manuscripts. Finally, we also discussed the literal principle that God used natural laws of communication to communicate in such a way that we can understand it. Scripture should be interpreted literally unless there's some indicator in the text itself to understand it to be figurative or symbolic. Well, that is a simple review of all that we discussed last week. Dr. Altizer, an expression that I think is helpful to introduce our listeners to is the analogy of Scripture. What is the analogy of Scripture, and why is this principle important for proper interpretation? Hey, Paul, that's a great question. Uh, Sometimes the analogy of scripture is used or conflated with the analogy of faith. Uh, You can look in hermeneutics books and look them up. Some use one faith, some use scripture. But uh, from what I was taught, the analogy of scripture is best. And basically, this is a hermeneutical principle that relates to the understanding or explaining scripture with scripture. For example, 
uh, you would take less clear passages and compare them with more clear central passages uh, to line up what they would mean. Uh, for example, Acts 2.38, which we have a lot of uh, churches in our area that preach that one verse, hmm. you know, and we have people that come to our church who get saved and they're very confused over, you know, repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. And I always tell them, you know, can you show me one more verse that is parallel to that? And so they struggle doing that, you know. So what we do is we take them to clear passages of what it means uh, to trust Christ as Savior. And then we explain that in its historical, literal, grammatical context and share with them what Peter was telling the Jewish believers at Pentecost, uh, not the Church of Christ. But anyway, this is the term where you compare one thing, one scripture with another. So anyway, it's a helpful principle that came out of the Protestant Reformation, and it's very useful. On a practical note, let me say this. Somebody showed this to me, and I've passed this on to several of our students. Dr. Ryrie has a section in the back of his basic theology book, which we had to memorize as students in Bible college. And he has a section back there called Central Passages. And he goes through every major doctrine in systematic theology and gives a central passage for it. So if you read this basic theology for your listeners or people that look at it, that's a great place to uh, get a founding and a, you know, a grounding in some of the central locations for some of the major doctrines. So analogy means like a comparison or a parallel idea. Yeah, analogy, you know, basically is a comparison between two things, basically for the purpose of explanation or clarification. And so in the idea of scripture, it's comparing one with the other. So Dr. Stallett, how would you distinguish between analogy of scripture and analogy of faith? We, we've talked about this a little bit off, offline. Yeah, and of course there are different, different ways that that's been done, but uh, to, to boil it down uh, in its simple, in church history, analogy of faith was, is this consistent with Christian faith, which usually boiled down to, is this consistent with the creeds? And so it became a church tradition comparison, Bible versus church tradition and the interpretation of the church. That would be analogy of faith. Uh, analogy of scripture in, in the Protestant sense is different as we uh, just compare scripture with scripture. And as, um, as John was laying out, we do different things. We look at clear passages as opposed to hard ones. Um, uh, we make sure the themes are the same in the passages. We don't conflate things that have no, no comparison whatsoever. It's those kinds of things as we work through how, how we put things together. So scripture is still absolute basis of authority uh, in, in our usage of analogy of scripture versus analogy of faith would be saying that the church dogma or church tradition is authoritative and we want to line things up make sure it's in agreement with the church tradition is that correct is that yes yeah so we all here um adhere to the analogy of scripture and some people may and we don't want to um fault people that might be using analogy of faith like they intend to like we're using analogy of scripture so we want to give grace and understanding uh that maybe not everybody's using these terms the same but we like to use analogy of scripture because we do believe uh, that scripture interprets scripture. It's not another external authority uh, determining what the scripture means. And uh, of course, the Protestant Reformation was all about that, right? That we're the priests, priests of God. We're all a part of the priesthood and the Bible's available in, in our, our languages and we can understand it and study it for ourselves and we can study the original languages as well. And, um, and so uh, interpreting the less clear passages with the more clear passages, important hermeneutical principle. Well, there's a great deal of discussion within our circles, um, and rightly so, regarding the phrase single meaning. And this might be getting a little higher in conversation about hermeneutics than maybe even some of our listeners have been familiar with, but I think it's still helpful and important to discuss the, the concept of single meaning. Um, Dr. Stallard, what is meant by single meaning? And do you hold to it? And if so, why or why not? Okay. 
Um, Two minutes. Yes, I hold to single meaning. And uh, if I have to hunt for several meanings, I'm in trouble. Uh, it's, it's hard enough to get the one meaning as we do our exegetical process. A single meaning means a passage does not have multiple meanings. You can have one meaning, many applications. We often say that little phrase. And then there's and there's also the use of passages in theology. And I'll give an illustration maybe a little bit later. Uh, but why do I hold to single meaning? Well, first of all, I've already told you I hold to literal interpretation. So, uh, and you can't have literal interpretation, I think, without single meaning. If you're going to have a grammatical, textually based approach, it's going to be very hard to suggest that you have a, a um, extra layer of meaning given to the text. Uh, number two, I think it protects against, and this is related like the flip side of a coin, it protects against allegory and subjectivism. Uh, you know, if I, two layers are often a literal meaning and a secondary meaning that's kind of a subjective spiritual either application or uh, some kind of high level uh, belief system that I have put in place over on top of the text. And so I don't want to be subjective. And I think understanding that there's a single meaning helps protect against that. And uh, I think a place where this shows up thirdly is in the use of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, some will, will take a, the New Testament use of an Old Testament passage and suggest that there are double, there's double meaning uh, in an Old Testament text. Rather than seeing the New Testament text as perhaps sometimes just using the imagery of an Old Testament text. And it's not necessarily saying this is the meaning of this Old Testament text. So you have to really dig down deep and, and understand the, what the text is saying in both Old and New Testament. And what we don't want to do is confuse the theological conclusions with exegetical meaning. Now, I've said a lot of stuff, and maybe it's not easily understood. Let me give an illustration. I think I gave this in one of our other podcasts. Paul, I don't remember. But in Genesis 3, I often ask my students, who tempted Eve? And uh, some of them will say, Satan. Of course, and then I say, okay, show me the word Satan in Genesis 3. And the word Satan is not in Genesis 3. The word devil is not there at all. So how do you come to that conclusion? Well, you come to that conclusion by coordinating analogy of faith, or excuse me, analogy of scripture, <laughs> to other passages, uh, like Revelation 12, you know, where Satan, dragon, serpent, snake, all those things are the same thing. So it's referring to uh, our, our grand enemy, uh, the fallen angel, Satan. What I can say is uh, that uh, Satan is the answer to the question, what happened in the garden? So the event that Genesis 3 talked about, we can say theologically that's Satan, you know, tempting Eve and Adam. Uh, and so, but we have to say these things carefully. Because the exegetical meaning of Genesis 3 is not Satan, it's serpent. Mm -hmm. and so we have to keep these things in perspective, tighten up the ship a little bit so that we don't go astray. That was an easy example. As we get into other things, we want to make sure that we're sharp and not go off the rails. And so that's, uh, I think, single meaning keeps us on the rails. God is communicating several things. I'm, go back to our writings we talked about, especially Chris's voluminous writings. I don't think there's anywhere in his writings that he actually intended multiple meanings to any passage that he's written. Is that true, Chris? That's correct, 100%. Correct. <laughs> okay. So, that's not how I read it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, it's just normal communication, single meaning. And so when we get into double meaning stuff, I think, you know, modern studies uh, have, I think, got us off the rails on that point. And we need to go back to simpler understanding of the word of God. Yeah, and, and of course, we can look at the history of interpretation, and we can see Origen and Augustine, who had three and four different levels of meaning, right? And, and really forsaking the historical meaning for a deeper hidden, the, you know, allegorical meaning. So that's some of the issues that we're discussing, and we want to we want to avoid, right? And uh, that kind of leads into a question that I'm going to ask Dr. Cohn here in a little bit with the allegorical method. But I want to uh, 
someone that's now with the Lord, Robert Thomas, right? Um, Dr. Thomas wrote a, an article in, entitled The New Testament Use of the Old Testament. It's in the Master's uh, Seminary Journal. Uh, I found very helpful. In fact, I'm having my students in the NTCGS, National Theological College and Graduate School. I'm teaching a, a group in uh, East Africa right now, and I'm requiring them to read that article. I think it does a great job to show single meaning and, and its importance. Um, just clearly how other people are, I think, making some mistakes uh, in their uh, double meanings and multiple um, meanings. Anyhow, um, you can probably find that most any, you can probably even find it online. If you don't have it, I can provide it for you. You can email me at ltw, learn the word, ltw uh, at wool.org, uh, ltw podcast at wool.org. Well, um, Professor Katolka, prof, yes, prof, sir. Word of Life Bible Institute professor, you teach here for us. Um, uh, and uh, one of the issues we think about is the word, and one of my favorite theological words, perspicuity. Right? I perspicuity know, you gave me the hardest <laughs> word. You gave me the hardest word, Paul. <laughs> Tell us, what is the perspicuity of scripture and what, what's it got to do with hermeneutics? I was perspiring when you gave me this word perspicuity. Now, uh, say that 10 times fast. No, perspicuity, in light of what we're talking about with hermeneutics and interpretation, is important because I do think it drills down to how we left our last episode of kind of uh, what do we say to the amateur um, Bible in, you know, interpreter? You know, what's a word of encouragement for them? Well, this is a theology of encouragement <laughs> for, for those uh, for those who what might consider themselves amateurs, you know, because technically, like we've been talking about, you can have a PhD behind your name, and that's fantastic. And I wish I had some behind my name. But at the same time, there are people who wake up every single morning and they, with devotion, open the scriptures. I've met, you know, 90 year old women who every morning spend time with the Lord read through the scriptures. My, my wife's grand, uh, grandmother died at 100 years old, and her Bible was worn out from cover to cover because she dedicated her life to reading God's word and making it important to her. So in some way, she was her own, uh, you know, she was interpreting the scriptures through the way that she was reading it. And, and so uh, uh, perspicuity, as we're talking about this, is kind of a basic doctrine that really the Bible can be understood by anybody, because of, if you're a believer, you have the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit that's guiding you um, to search the scriptures and judge for yourself. Now, this is kind of where the rub comes in with what we're talking about, because we're talking about the fact that hermeneutics, as we've been going through this, hermeneutics is not something that, you know, it's just so we, something we throw against the wall and hope that it sticks, that there is a science to it. And as I, in our, in our, in our previous uh, podcast, um, both Chris and Mike had mentioned that it's a, it's a science, and science means it's not chaotic. There's a structure to it. So how, how do we allow the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit to guide us as we're opening the scriptures, reading the scriptures, um, to th th that, that, that essence that's of the Holy Spirit in us also work within the methods uh, that we use for hermeneutics for the interpretation of scripture? And this becomes important. Now, you know, we've dabbled a little bit in the fact that in the, in the medieval church and, you know, coming into the fourth century and fifth century and onward, uh, the, the, the church was controlling who could read the scriptures and how those scriptures were understood. And you see that even in, in uh, more, uh, I'll even say in, in the Catholic church, you know, there's a liturgical process. No one's opening the Bible. They're reading through a liturgy that is guided by the church, and that's usually what people get from the scriptures. Uh, it's left to the priest to interpret it. And so, you know, even in the medieval church, uh, perspicuity was something that they actually looked down upon. They spoke against. The common man can't understand this. It's not the job of the common man to, to know the scriptures, to interpret the scriptures. You leave that to us, you common man, because uh, it, you'll ruin it. And we don't want you to ruin it because that leads to, as Mike was talking about in the last 
um, uh, earlier and what John was talking about earlier, the analogy of faith and the analogy um, of scripture is that what, what happens is you end up ruining the creeds or you end up ruining the dogma of the church because of your interpretation of it. So leave it to us, you stay away. Well, you get to Martin Luther and it's the total opposite. Perspicuity becomes something that is embraced. It simply um, means clarity, right? The clarity of the scriptures that we are the one, like that that the the by, let let the let the words of, of God speak for themselves to those who are reading it. It's clear; it can be understood. And really, I think this changed the dynamics uh, when that became a reality as the as a result of the Protestant Reformation. It changed the dynamics of how we understand where we are even today and how we have a our hermeneutic uh, and our, our, our methodology and how we interpret the scriptures because the common man got their hands on the Bible and, be, and began the process of creating a system in order that we might look at the scriptures and provide uh, uh, a way to read it, an interpretive model to read it. And so anyway, I, I think it's important for us to understand is that while it, it can almost sound, uh, perspicuity, perspicuity can almost sound like this wild west mentality anything goes. I do not believe that that's the way God intended it to be, that within the guidelines of what we're saying is proper biblical uh, interpretation and hermeneutic, that through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit working in us and the clarity of the scriptures, we can come to what God is telling us uh, through his word, through a, as we talked about before, a historical, grammatical, literal interpretation. So, you know, something that if somebody's interested in this, I would highly recommend Larry Pettigrew's uh, uh, paper that he did for Master's Seminary. You can find it online. It's free. It's fantastic. It walks you through it. It's something I even looked at to brush up on this conversation. So uh, uh, a great a great topic for what we're talking about with hermeneutics. Yeah, so I, I love... Um... I love this word, perspicuity, but the clarity, I love this principle that there are a lot of uh, degrees represented in this panel here, right? A lot of bachelor's and master's degrees and PhDs and THDs, uh, but you don't have to have a PhD to understand the Bible, right? Um, uh, and we want the common person, everyone to study the word for themselves. It takes effort and work, right? It's not just, like you said, throwing things against the wall and make it see and saying, this means to me, I read it once and it means to me this, right? That's not the approach. It takes work, takes effort, but we can understand it. Um, and uh, a person that hasn't gone to seminary can study and understand the word. And so we're thankful that God, obviously, even the Koine Greek, right? The common Greek was used, not the classical Greek for a reason, or not the uh, Greek of the oligarchy for a reason, to because um, God wanted to communicate, and he intended to communicate and was able to communicate because he is God, right? What he intended to do, he actually did. So thank you for that. So... Um, we have been advocating the historical grammatical literal approach to the interpretation of scripture as being the best way to approach scripture, but there are other methods, inferior methods out there. Um, again, I'm asking you, Dr. Cohn, to do something very complex in a short period of time. So would you explain a few of those uh, inadequate approaches? I love it. These other guys get to they get to talk about the wonderful aspects of, <laughs> of uh, uh, hermeneutics, and I, I get to deal with the, <laughs> the problems. That, that fits really well. Thanks a lot for that. <laughs> well, you know, as, as you were uh, talking about kind of coming out of the Protestant Reformation and what really motivated the, the Reformation, and uh, as we're talking about even analogy of Scripture, I was thinking about uh, one particular example that... Uh, and, and as, as Mike was talking about single meaning, this popped into my head, that John Calvin uh, kind of brought with him, even into the Reformation, he brought with him the medieval understanding of multiple, specifically four layers of interpretation. And, and he, he helped move somewhat away from that. Martin Luther got us further. But, but Calvin... Uh, Remarkably, especially when it came to eschatology, he, he and it, when it came to the law of Moses, in order to place believers under the law, he recognized there was a deeper meaning 
Uh, and you had to go further than the literal meaning of what the text says. Uh, otherwise, you're not doing the character of God justice. So he's reading some theology into his, into his conclusion, which, which causes him to embrace something of a medieval hermeneutic method. And then the, he, he critiques the analogy of faith only to a small degree. He suggests that we actually should employ it and that for the first 500 years, the interpreters largely got it right. And then they, they got it wrong for a while, but the Holy Spirit will make sure that we, we get it right in the end. This is his hermeneutic approach. And it, it's no wonder that uh, in, in this particular theological system, we have almost a, a, an admixture or a hodgepodge of theological methods that create conclusions that we can't really exegetically justify. And, and I was thinking about that, that even, even those most educated and most skilled and, and maybe brightest among us are still prone to the errors that we all are, uh, which is interjecting ourselves into the process. And so when you think about some specific uh, approaches that are erroneous, that are problematic, front and center would be what, what is often called the theological hermeneutic. The theological hermeneutic is me reading my theology into the text. This is the most common error. Uh, and it's, it's me maybe not being satisfied with, uh, with the simplicity. Uh, and I love the word perspicuity. Five syllables to, to <laughs> use. Make clear, word yeah, clear. Yeah, simple, right? Uh, the, the, the simplicity of what the scripture says, uh, sometimes we just don't like it. We don't, we don't agree with those conclusions. And so we interject ourselves, and we become the authority. The theological method allows me to do that all day long. Uh, when we get to the core of all of the different hermeneutic methods that are problematic, uh, they're all doing the same thing. The interpreter is reading what they want to read into the text. Um, so that'd be the theological hermeneutic. Uh, another, I'll just mention a couple of them. Another might be the allegorical uh, hermeneutic, which is uh, essentially... Uh, reading the text in a figurative way uh, because the a, a normal literal reading might be too problematic. You know, maybe uh, God's character being shown here, he's, he's being jealous here and we don't want to see him being jealous. So we've got to, we've got to have a figurative reading. Um, mm. But the bottom line is someone has to make a decision about what's to be read normally and what's to be read uh, metaphorically. And as, as Mike has shared in another context, uh, you know, he shared that uh, you, you have to recognize metaphor when it's there in the text, but you do that through a normative, little grammatical, historical, hermeneutic method. The allegorical method abandons that uh, arbitrarily uh, seeing metaphor in order largely to fix problems. A, a real close cousin of the allegorical model might be spiritualization where I'm looking for a deeper meaning. The literal is just too plain. The Song of Solomon can't really actually be about uh, a sexual relationship and a, and a man and a woman. It's got to be about something to do with God, right? So we spiritualize it and, and, and we end up with some really kooky ideas. Um, you've talked about postmodernism, uh, Paul, and in some of our other contexts, and how postmodernism is very much me-centered, each of our narratives and our contexts matter equally, uh, and, and so we're all participating in meaning and determining meaning, uh, and, and in a postmodern hermeneutic, uh, essentially, I'm, I am enthroned as the interpreter, uh, and uh, my context is more important than the historical or, or grammatical context, uh, and there's a number of ways that's expressed. So, but, but to simplify it, if I am using an interpretive method where I am helping to determine what the meaning of the text is, then I'm doing it wrong. Uh, and uh, the literal grammatical historical, again, whatever order we want to put these words, that approach is the only one of all of these methods that allows us to consistently sit back and let the text determine 
let the author of the text determine what is what is meant as opposed to me interjecting myself. Excellent. You did a, an incredible job of synthesizing a lot of very complex systems or methods into just a short period of time. And I, uh, I just quoted it's like you've done that before. I just I plagiarized from one of my experts. I don't think so. I imagine you've uh, taught that a few times if you're able to do that though so uh, quickly um, and accurately. So, well, as we finish today's podcast, I'd like each of you to succinctly give your strongest one or two arguments for why the historical grammatical literal approach, uh, what we've been articulating in these two podcasts, are the proper uh, method and uh, best way to approach and interpret God's word. Would you do that for me? Sure, Paul. I'll start out here. Um, let me just say that the clearest thing is uh, the fact that I can understand your question hmm. and how to answer it is an argument for literal interpretation. How would I even know how to answer your question uh, if I didn't understand that? And second of all, you know, God is the creator of language and he created it to be understood. So that argues in itself, you know, do not eat from this tree. I mean, how, how many ways can you interpret that? Hmm. And Adam obviously understood it, didn't listen to it, and here we are today. So that would be my argument. I, I love that John is appealing to the nature of language and that God has created and he's uh, given language and he's determined it's a useful a suitable vehicle for his revelation, then it's, it's good enough for me. I appreciate that argument very much. Uh, I would also add to that uh, the example of scripture. If our hermeneutic method is derived externally uh, from some other source, then scripture is not sufficient. Uh, it isn't of as great a value as we might think. If on the other hand, within the text itself, uh, there's a hermeneutic method both described and prescribed, and we can read it in the normative way we would read any, any, any document and arrive at that method, which I believe we can, uh, then, then we have uh, a biblical record that is indeed is sufficient providing its own methodology. And we see that in Genesis, you know, 2000 year precedent of, uh, as, as John mentioned, uh, right from Genesis chapter two. Uh, from very early on, uh, God communicates with Adam. Adam understands it clearly, so much so that when he violates the command, he's hiding. He's afraid. And, and uh, you know, God tells Noah, hey, build a boat and use these specifications. Noah builds a boat according to those specifications, according to all that God had commanded. He didn't miss the deeper meaning. He wasn't looking for some allegorical metaphor. He, he was taking God at face value. And we see example after example throughout the 2000 years of Genesis that make it very clear that unless there's a very strong exegetically provable biblical precedent to vary from this literal grammatic historical approach, normative approach to understanding communication, then we, we better just stick with the, the biblical precedent. Yeah, the only thing I'll add to you know, why I think there's a great value to a historical, grammatical, and uh, literal interpretation is because, uh, and I think John and Chris has summed it up perfectly. Uh, so I'm only adding what I feel like is extra here, but I'm in Jewish ministry. I, I love reading the, the law and understanding the law. I don't think the law was meant to be something uh, that was difficult for the Israelites to understand. I think it was very simple for them to understand. And I'm reminded of Deuteronomy 6 4, which says, Here, O Israel. Very, very simple concept. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, it, is the, it is the foundation of Judaism uh, for the Jewish person. It doesn't matter if they're religious or not, that they know the Shema. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, to hear means that God is just communi communicating something plain, something uh, with clarity, um, that we should be able to understand. And I think the best method for doing that is to go back and understand the intent of the author, uh, what was going on during that time historically, and moving forward into the, 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 uh, the grammatical elements of the, of, uh, of the writings that were going on, 
uh, into the genres of writings and into our understanding of a literal interpretation of the scriptures. So I don't think God was trying to confuse us. I, I think that's really what it comes down to. Final word. Yeah. Let me uh, piggyback on what uh, Prof. Katoka just said. Uh, I would love to stand at the foot of Mount Sinai and listen to the words in that context. My Hebrew would have to be a little bit better to get it all. Uh, and know that God was speaking to me at face value. In fact, uh, there is no certainty to our interpretation if we don't follow grammatical historical interpretation. There just isn't any uncertainty. And in fact, maybe I should throw the Bible away. Uh, we need to embrace normal communications. I like the way Chris said that. Uh, God is not hiding from us in some hidden layers of meanings. He has spoken. He's there and he's spoken. And that's not original with me, but I think that's enough. And without little interpretation, I don't think we have that. Gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to provide our listeners with this helpful introduction and overview of hermeneutics. And to our listeners, I trust that this series of programs has helped you to think through the issues of Bible interpretation and why we approach scripture the way we do. Maybe it has also helped you to evaluate whether you need to re-examine your approach and to adopt the historical grammatical literal approach. Well, today's podcast has come to a close, but I hope you, our listening and viewing audiences, will tune in again next week for another great podcast. In next week's program, Dr. Altizer, Dr. Cohn, Professor Katolka, Dr. Stallard, and Dr. Bookman will discuss the theocratic kingdom, God's kingdom on earth. We will examine the most important passages of scripture on the subject, and show, and show how important it is to the entire narrative of Scripture. You won't want to miss it. But in the meantime, why don't you go check out our Learn the Word YouTube channel? We will be uploading these podcasts as well as other videos in the Learn the Word family of resources there. To find our Learn the Word YouTube channel, go to learn.wol.org forward slash podcast and click on the YouTube link. Again, go to learn.wol.org forward slash podcast and click on the YouTube link. And don't forget to subscribe so that you are made aware when new content becomes available. And to help us to make our YouTube channel more visible for those searching for faith affirming content. Also, I want to let you know that in an upcoming program, we are going to have a podcast devoted entirely to answering your submitted questions. I will have several of my favorite guests from previous podcasts to field your questions. Please send those to me at the LTW podcast at WOL.org. That's LTW podcast at WOL.org. Well, I hope you'll join us again next week for another great podcast, great conversation with my prestigious guests. But until next time, make it your ambition to learn the word. <laughs>